All right, we were starting with carbon monoxide, and my first point was it's a common way to successfully commit suicide. Uh, but you'll see accidental exposures uh, come in. It's the old story, you know, it looks like the flu, um, and it's easy to miss, and indeed that's the case. The most recent one of these I saw at Stony Brook was a girl who came, on with a, came in with a headache, no history of migraines, um, and the resident went in and talked to her, and we were having the should we scan her kind of conversation and those kinds of things, and I went in to see her and talked to her. And oftentimes this is the case, when you just get to a little more free-flowing conversation, less directed, I'd ask, did anything happen at the house, was anything on you? And that was when she chose to mention that the smoke alarm had gone off that morning. I was like, oh, that could be important. Thank you with the alarm sound effects. Um, I appreciate that. Um, and indeed, she had a carbon monoxide level that was elevated, and you know she hadn't been aware of there being a problem. It was a rental property, and they had to find out that the furnace was bad and things like that. You may get these stories of someone using a hibachi in the house because it rained or things like that. Um, and then the, the old classic tox question is, um, you know, is your dog sick? You know, because if they have a pet and the pet is sick, we get different viral illnesses. So it's not like if you have the flu, they have the flu. If you're both sick, you and your dog, it's carbon monoxide. There are a couple of those weird tox questions that have, you ask about their pets. Did your bird die? That's like the Teflon pan left on the, uh, you know, that apparently kills birds in a second. Um, but anyway, so uh, with carbon monoxide, um, altered mental status, you want to do an EKG and look for EKG changes because they may not complain of chest uh, pain, but the high oxygen consumption organs are going to be involved, so that's, heart, that's brain and um, heart, and so you want to look for that. And remember, there are multiple levels of toxicity. It's not just the carbon monoxide binding up the hemoglobin. There's also the carbon monoxide effects intracellularly. And there's direct myopathic effects, so they get cardiogenic shock because they have a combination of hypoxia with direct myopathic effects of carbon monoxide as well. Remember the difference quickly, we'll talk about cyanide more, but between carbon monoxide and cyanide, carbon monoxide is gradual onset of symptoms, headache and such, whereas immediate collapse on the scene of a fire where they suddenly go down, that's cyanide. That's not carbon monoxide. And so that's a, a different thing. Here we have these half-lives lifted on this slide. It is a fair game question. I've seen it asked, um, you know, and it shows why you put them on, you know, it's five-hour half-life on room air, one and a half on 100% O2. So remember, they go on 100% O2 immediately. And if you put them in, in uh, um, a two level of a uh, increased atmospheric pressure at two ATM, then you can drop the half-life all the way to 20 minutes. There is this uh, reported delayed neuropsychiatric syndrome with significant carbon monoxide uh, poisonings, and those who believe in hyperbaric oxygen treatment swear that that's the real reason you do this, is to decrease that. The literature is a mess on the topic, but I think if you're faced with a significant carbon monoxide intoxication on an exam, the answer is still hyperbaric oxygen treatment, although there's lots of ongoing debate about this. Remember, in pregnancy, fetal hemoglobin binds too, and so you would use lower levels of intoxication and lesser symptoms in a pregnant woman as an indication to put her in a chamber. And there's a monoplace chamber uh, that you could do two ATMs at and <laughs> decrease the half-life and, and hopefully improve it. Remember that in a carbon monoxide overdose, the pulse ox will be normal. So you have to ask for the calculated carboxyhemoglobins, and you got to look for, because um, the oximeter will measure carboxyhemoglobin as normal. Uh, the PaO2 on an ABG is often normal in these cases as well, and so you've got to ask the lab to measure the carboxyhemoglobin levels specifically. All right, that's carbon monoxide, really common cause of successful suicide. Sometimes a diagnostic challenge when it's accidental and it's furnaces, um, and things like that, hibachis, other things that are the cause. Caustic and it's colorless and odorless, right? So uh, you're not going to smell anything off in case. Now we go to caustics, and alkali are worse than acids because alkali have liquefaction necrosis that continues to proceed as opposed to acids that cause coagulation necrosis and often arrests at a cutaneous level. When you talk about someone who, you know, tried to choke you know, chug down some lye or Drano or something like that. Um, remember that the presence of oropharyngeal burns or absence doesn't really tell you what's going on further down. 
Some people really throw the Drano back, and so there's not much in their mouth, but they still have significant esophageal burns, and so they still need to be scoped. So your intention to get these people scoped emergently should be high if the question asks, do they need endoscopy, their mouth looks clear, the answer is yes, they do. Uh, don't give charcoal because it's going to mess up all the burns and it doesn't work. If it's hydrofluoric acid ingestion, which is really uncommon, right? Use most hydrofluoric acid exposures are from rust remover and etching and their fingers and skin. But if it's ingested, you can give milk and mag citrate by an NG. Solid alkali, usually it's, uh, it's lye, dilute with water or milk. And other caustic injections, uh, ingestions, dilution causes an exothermic reaction and it can cause vomiting, so don't do that. Upper, upright chest x-ray, looking for perfs and free air and urgent endoscopy, looking for burns in the esophagus, which will over time become this, which is a high esophageal stricture from a full thickness burn. Chlorine gas, green smelling, pungent odor, makes your eyes water, gives you pneumonitis, um, can cause pulmonary edema, supportive care, humidified oxygen. This usually happens at a hazmat scene or an industrial scene where the gas is leaking. If you talk to the real experts in hazmat, they'll tell you that the key piece of equipment for them is 10 by 50 binoculars, because that's close enough. And if you could have any other piece of information, you'd like to know the prevailing wind direction so you could stay out of the cloud as it moved. Clonidine overdoses, we see these a lot, um, particularly in jail populations, and the reason they do it is because they're withdrawing from opiates. So they know that the clonidine might help them. So someone in their jail block says they have hypertension that requires clonidine, and they end up on a clonidine patch or have clonidine tablets, and people will eat the clonidine patch, which obviously is you know, supposed to be delivered gradually, and now they have a clonidine overdose that looks like an opiate overdose with coma, meiosis, and respiratory depression. Treatments, fluids, atropine, and pressors as needed. Most of these can be ridden out with supportive care, and so you should recognize that. Cyanide, now we're talking about the immediate collapse on the scene of the fire. Um, it may smell like bitter almonds. The fire source will be burning plastics, electronic equipment, synthetic you know, tiles in the ceiling. This place would be, and as it was back in 1980 when it burned, Right, you guys know this is the haunted hotel, 1980, something like 80 people died up on the upper floors. Fire started near where we are right now in one of these kitchens on the other side of this wall, and the upper floors of the hotel filled up with um, bad smoke filled with cyanide and other toxic fumes, and most of the people who died died of smoke inhalation and cyanide. Um, now, uh, they won't be cyanotic with this. They'll have a normal PaO2 and O2 sat. Um, and if someone immediately collapses, you want to go after this. They too will have a severe acidosis with an anion gap. Um, and the treatment of this is to create a controlled state of methemoglobinemia, um, which can give you cyanomethemoglobin, which you can get rid of. So the nitrites will create that. So you can start with the amyl nitrate poppers that are inhaled, then go to the sodium nitrite, then to the thiosulfate, um, which uh, ultimately uh, will give you sodium thiosulfate. Um, and the thiocyanate, which is renally excreted. Hydroxycobalamin, the vitamin B12, is a pretty expensive form of treatment of this, but a lot of fire chiefs want it, again, because this is for treatment of the fireman who collapses on the scene, um, and that forms a compound which is renally excreted. So the hydroxycobalamin, which is sort of new, but not so new that it's not testable. So you ought to be aware of that. That's a testable component of cyanide toxicity. Didge overdoses, we stop seeing them mostly because people realize that didge really doesn't work, um, right? It's, it, it, in, the, in the late 90s and stuff, there were these didge withdrawal trials of people with stage four, New York State heart class four, heart failure that supposedly were didge dependent. They removed their didge and they were all the same. Didge is a lousy negative chronotrope for AFib and it's a lousy positive inotrope for heart failure. It does neither and it, very well, and it has a narrow therapeutic index. And at one time, DIG was one of the most common reasons 
um, because of that narrow therapeutic index, DIG toxicity was a really common reason to be admitted to the hospital. But, and, and nowadays, we're all concerned about, right, the CHF epidemic, and you have an OBS unit where you do some CHF care and try and avoid re-hospitalizing them, because if your hospital re-hospitalizes these CHF patients, it counts negative against your performance, so you put them in OBS and try and do that. Um, and we're very concerned about this epidemic, and the reason the epidemic is out there is because we stopped killing them. It used to be we put them on DIG and Lasix, which is an excellent way to cull the herd, because when they're on Lasix, they get a little hypokalemia, which increases their cardiac irritability. Then they get a little worsening of their heart failure, and they stop metabolizing their DIG, so their DIG level goes up. So when they meet, the DIG level and the K meet at two and a half, they die of V-fib. So we, for years, were culling the DIG herd, the, the, the CHF herd, with you know, DIG toxicity and cardiac arrest. You don't see that anymore because they're not on DIG anymore. Um, the antidote, uh, remember, it poisons the pump, so they get hyperkalemic in an acute DIG overdose. And a K greater than 5.5 is one of the indicators for digibine. That's a commonly asked question. Digibine, each vial ha binds about a half milligram of DIG. 20 vials will carry it cover anything, and there are multiple, for the toxicologists in the room, there are like three or four different ways to calculate the exact, using the DIG level, their, their height and weight, and all of that kind of stuff, to figure out exactly how to neutralize. That would be a, just an unreasonable question for a non-toxicologist. Uh, but if they ask you how many vials, 20 vials will cover everything. If you're not sure, you can start with 10. Uh, somewhere between 5 and 10 vials would be the choice I would choose with that. Start at 5 or 6 vials. And the stuff's pretty pricey, like all of the um, antibody-related synthetic products. It's a class 1A uh, antiarrhythmics that are contraindicated in DIG toxicity, so you don't want to use those. Um, low potassium, as I said, makes the heart irritable and worsens it. Low mag makes it worse. And high calcium increases toxicity. There's a big debate about whether they can get calcium chloride in part of their treatment. But generally speaking, the answer is no. Let's talk about the EKG with DIG, because it depends very specifically on how the question is asked. What is the most common EKG change with DIG use? And that's the Salvador Dali mustache SDT wave changes. What is the most common dysrhythmia associated with DIG usage? And that's just frequent PVCs. What is the pathognomonic dysrhythmia for DIG toxicity, that's PAT with block. DIG increases automaticity, which gives you PAT, um, uh, paroxysmal atrial tachycardia, PAT, and DIG decreases conduction velocity, which gives you the block. So PAT with block, I might have said PAC. If I did, I misspoke. It's PAT with block, that's pathognomonic. There is another pathognomonic uh, dysrhythmia, but it's almost never asked about, which is bidirectional VTAC. The one they ask is PAT with block. Calcium indication, as we indicated, uh, dis, uh, is uh, not indicated in terms of, I mean, there are people who would argue this, but for standard answers, not indicated. GHB, uh, GHB, gamma hydroxybutyric acid, became a drug of abuse among weightlifters, uh, primarily on the West Coast, and Gold's Gym was associated with this in Venice Beach. And these guys are all, you know, trying to make themselves bigger and become, you know, they're all interested in the weight gainer 5,000 muscle milk and all those kinds of things because they want to bulk up and then turn that into muscle. And they don't want to get busted by the testers at the contest that are looking for steroids and other anabolic compounds. And it turned out that GHB was not being tested for. And so when they realized they could use it as a weight gainer, and where this comes from is, you know, these are not geniuses. It's Gold's Gym go there. They're not geniuses. Um, what they found out was they were looking for things like what animal gains the most weight quickly? And it's a grizzly bear pregnant preparing to hibernate. They have to put on a ton of weight so they can have, you know, the cubs while they're hibernating and then they, they start feeding and then they come out raving hungry after a tremendous, but they have to gain all this weight to do that. And in grizzly bears, they have a lot of what's called brown fat, and one of the anabolic things in brown fat is GHB. That's, is, you know, and that was enough information for the weightlifters. There needed to be no human trials, nothing beyond that. 
Me want to be big like Grizzly. Grizzly. Gain weight, weight gainer. And they started using it and found you could get a little high with it, and you could even get, to, if you overdose on it, you could even knock someone out, and it became a date rape drug. And these guys all worked as bouncers at the clubs in South, Southern California uh, when they weren't in the gym, and they started dispensing it at the doors. And that's how it came out. And it became a date rape drug as well. And it will knock you down. It's, it's you know, um, uh, um, but it usually wears off. One of the things about them is they might need intubated. Occasionally, they just, they just go apneic on you. And unlike other causes of apnea where the respiratory rate seems to slow gradually, and you're like, hey, I'm going to have to do something about this, they just stop breathing. You're like, you're like going about your business, okay, they're a little altered, they got this thing on. And then you turn around and someone's like, they're not breathing, doctor. Like, what? And then they extubate themselves four to six hours later. Um, and that's GHB story. It's, it's hard to test for. You have to send specific testing if you want to find it. It's not routinely detected on drug screens. And if they're co-ingested with alcohol, really common, because it's sort of a club drug scene, um, you'll see it um, last a little longer because it's potentiated by the sedative hypnotic effect. GHB withdrawal, if people are using GHB regularly, and they often will describe it as being used by the capfuls. But someone who's taking two, three, four capfuls every six, seven hours, and they stop, they get a GHB abstinence syndrome that looks just like alcohol withdrawal, exactly, and it's managed exactly, uh, exactly the same when that happens. Um, GHB mostly kind of came and went. Anyone seeing frequent GHB around? So it's kind of gone away. There's one place where I'm still encountering it every once in a while. Um, which is uh, specifically as a date rape drug in the gay community on the West Coast. So it's still being used in that, in that sort of thing, um, and you might encounter it there, so keep an eye out for it in that specific population. All right, now we're to hallucinogens. The more serotonergic they are, the more hallucinogenic they are. LSD is a pure serotonergic hallucinogen. If you looked at ecstasy, MDMA, it's sort of some serotonergic, some sympathomimetic, it's kind of in the middle. Um, and they get psychosis, anxiety, sympathomimetic, a little bit to a degree. Treatment's benzos, and if they're really, um, you know, having a lot of problems with the hallucinogen element, you might give some Haldol or some Droperidol if you had it around and keep them in a quiet room and let them ride it out. Hydrocarbons. So this, uh, this is still coming up and it's around. Halogenated hydrocarbons uh, ha and other toxic additives are, are worse, so you want to look for those. Um, aspiration, pneumonitis, coughing, tachycardia. Um, if you're talking about huffers, they often will have silver or gold paint in their eyebrows or in their hair. They're filling a, a bag with it and spraying that in there. And the reason it's silver or gold paint because those are heavier pigments, so there's more propellant in the can. So if you see a lot of graffiti around your house or in the underpasses near your home that have gold and silver in them, they're usually kids down there huffing. Um, and if you're, like, if you're a member of the Audubon Society and you're out bird watching, you know, you're there you can see the bright red cardinal. And then over here underneath the underpass, you can see the silver-headed huffer. Um, <laughs> you know. And then when they run from the police, if the police come to make them stop graffiti, they'll have, they, as they ramp up and they get adrenergic, they have this cardiac sensitization and they'll often have, uh, they'll often collapse with a dysrhythmia um, because of the sensitization of their myocardium along with the catecholamines induced by the cops showing up. Um, if it's an oral ingestion, you can lavage them if, the, if they're halogenated or aromatics are involved. Um, and the chest x-ray, you ought to do, consider doing a delayed one and watching them for at least four to six hours to see if they're going to get any of those findings, which can be in a delayed fashion. Here's the mnemonic out there, CHAMP, for the toxicity things that you'd really want to get the poison center involved and an expert involved, CHAMP for halogens, aromatics, metals, pesticides, those are all things that would worsen this substantially. Hydrogen fluoride, if the question mentions etching or rust remover, it's hydrogen fluoride that they're after. Um, and they'll get this skin burning, and the fluoride ions will keep penetrating until they're quote-unquote quenched. And the thing that will quench them is the calcium in your bones. So they'll get a full thickness burn all the way down to bone if you don't provide some alternative way of quenching it, which is why you would, one, you know, for a typical rust remover exposure with their hands all burning and on fire, they'll come in. You're going to mix up the calcium gluconate with some gel and apply it with a glove and see if that makes them better. 
if it doesn't make them better, you may need to escalate the treatment and give some injections, or you might need to do a beer block or intraarterial calcium gluconate. You keep going up until the pain goes away. So you don't want to do it if it's only a couple fingers. I've seen people do things like put a digital block up. No, you don't want to do a digital block for symptom relief. You need to know if they're still hurting, because if they're still hurting, you would escalate the treatment. So don't digital block these. This picture is a little bit wrong because it shows the liquid calcium gluconate uh, to mix with the KY jelly and then put the glove on. It works a lot better if you have the powdered stuff to mix with the KY jelly. The liquid stuff makes a mess. You can use it, but the powdered form before it's been, you know, the hydrophilized calcium is a way better way to mix it into the jelly than you smear it on the hands and put a glove on and watch them to see if their pain resolves. And if it doesn't, then you escalate the treatment. Hydrogen sulfide, this happens in oil refineries. If you were to look in the Saudi toxic, you know, toxicity journals, it, it can come out of, uh, out of wells. But more commonly, we think of it as sewer gas. Um, you know, I mentioned I worked on farms where they have, as a kid, and they'd have these like conveyors and things, you'd be shoveling cow shit all the time. And at the end, there'd be this big manure basin. And if you fall into that manure basin, you're gonna be in hydrogen sulfide gas and you're gonna lose consciousness because it's a knockdown agent. And then if someone goes in to help you, they're gonna lose consciousness. And then there's gonna be two in the thing. And then the third, now, we're, now it's like an IQ test. If a third person goes in, they're not very smart. If they wait for someone with scuba equipment to come in, they're a little smarter. If you sit in that for any length of time, you're gonna be dead. Many of these don't arrive alive. They're dead on the scene. They'll tell you, they'll ask in the questions as you're go, you know, emptying their pockets, you found a discolored coin uh, or there was a rotten egg over. All of those things are to confirm hydrogen sulfide. Most of the care that hydrogen sulfide needs is supportive care, but there have been some recent suggestions that you might try enamel nitrate popper and then the sodium nitrite after that to make um, sulfmet hemoglobinuria. So sulfmet hemoglobinemia, where, which is less toxic, you'd get the sulfur out that way. Uh, but there's no really good trials to say that will work. And as I say, many of the people who have this happen in an industrial scene or on a farm or in a, you know, a sewer workers because it's sewer gas, they're found dead. Um, and so obviously not a lot of treatment works at that point. Um, higher affinity for methemoglobin than cytochrome oxidase. So treatment removed from the source, always put them on 100% O2. Um, they say you could use methylene blue here, but the cyanide antidote kit with the amyl nitrate poppers and the sodium nitrate is the way to go, if you're gonna try it. And did that say the coin thing at the bottom? Yeah, the coins in the pocket will be discolored. All right, isoniazid, there's some keys to the isoniazid. I don't know why they pick on the Vietnamese, but if, there's a, if the words Vietnamese occur in the question, um, it means that there's someone in the home who might have TB. I mean, obviously they could pick India, they could pick any other country where there's TB, but for some reason, they pick on the Vietnamese with this. So, this, so here what you have is a situation where a kid gets into two of grandma's um, INH pills and then has status epilepticus. So it's a toxic INH and the finding is coma, metabolic acid with seizures, and the treatment is to give them, there we go, one light went up, is to give them uh, pyridoxine, vitamin B6, if you don't know much, how much they overdosed on, start with five grams of B6. If you do know how much, because you have the pill bottle and you can do the counting and the math, it's gram for gram. You give a gram of pyridoxine for each gram of INH. age. Iron, another pretty common overdose, right? The, you know, you got kids around, mom with pregnancy with prenatal vitamins around, and so uh, these are an important one, and they're sneaky. They're sneaky, iron is sneaky in a bunch of ways. So first off, it has a secondary phase which is relatively asymptomatic, that makes it sneaky. And the first phase isn't that distinctive, it's a little GI upset. You can imagine that in the middle of winter, you got a bunch of kids with viral syndromes, barfing and puking, now you got another one barfing and puking, and you can see how without some really good questioning, you might miss it. Um, ultimately, it goes on if the levels are high to cause vasomotor collapse and hepatic renal failure. There you see zero to 48 hours, the quiescent syndrome. And you can see, unless you're careful, how easy it would be to send that zero to six hour kid home if you didn't get the history of an iron ingestion. That would be really easy to do. Now, if you do the testing when they come back and they started getting acidotic, 
They have a high white count and a high sugar. This is the next place where it's sneaky. So you got this two-year-old who, the real problem is they got into mom's iron, but they can now have a sugar of 300, a white count of 15, they're a little acidotic. And I've seen this happen because we use this as an oral case at LA County. Um, I've seen lots of senior residents go down the must be DKA pathway. No, it's iron. In fact, before we could get iron levels, we used to use the height of the white count and the sugar to tell you where you're at. So iron is sneaky and it has an antidote. So you want a four hour serum iron level. Remember that the, you can get the TIBCs and the other ancillary tests, but they're artificially wrong in acute overdose. So they're not that useful. Remember that. No charcoal, remember that. There's the labs, increased gap, increased glucose, increased white count. That looks like DKA. You can see how you can fall in that trap. In many questions, it's just about getting the KUB and seeing the radio opaque pills. That will tell you what's going on. And now you're after it. Now you know they got iron in them. Now you can check, uh, try and treat them with defuroxime, I am usually. If they're really sick, you give the, the defuroxamine IV. The problem with defuroxamine IV is it causes hypotension. The indication for giving it IV is a sick patient with hypotension. So now you're talking about a kid with hypotension on hypotension. I'd really like a poison center on the line. I'd like a pediatric intensivist to help me. You know, anytime you're going to be given def, defuroxime IV, it's a dicey proposition. And if you're correct in your, in your choice of def, they'll make the pink urine, the vin rosé urine, which shows there was chelatable drug that's now being removed renally. So def indication, severe GI symptoms, acidosis and shock, level really high. And, but if you have to go for defuroxine IV, remember, it's not, it's not, it's, this is not an easy game to play. There's the vin rosé urine being made as the increase in chelation by the defuroxine goes on. For many heavy metals, there used to be a variety of te challenge tests, and we used to talk about doing the defuroxine challenge. You didn't know if it was iron. Let's do a def challenge and look for the vin rosé. <laughs> Almost all of the heavy metal challenges are out in modern toxicology. They're perceived to be unreliable, delayed, sort of not very useful ways to go about this. You really should be pursuing levels as, uh, as a way of doing this rather than doing, for example, the defuroxime challenge. Lead, another common uh, cause of overdose, usually from paint. Um, there have been all kinds of problems with this over the, and nowadays if you're doing a home flip or something and there's any paint in there, you've got to get rid of that. It's just, I mean, finding lead in a house you've purchased is almost as bad as finding, you know, asbestos in a house you've purchased because it's now, you've you got to get all the, the appropriate authorities in to get it out. And the toxicity of lead is primarily CNS, and remember they can get a wrist drop. Peripheral neuropathy is a classic question, a foot drop or a wrist drop in a kid with pica, that's lead, that, that story all holds together. Um, serum levels are greater than 50 is severe. They also sometimes ask this odd question about lead, which is what might be seen on the smear? And it's basophilic stippling um, of, of your cells that they'll see, which indicates there's lead. And you might see lead lines, like that's a, see the distal radius and distal ulna, See the very dense, that's a lead line in kid with chronic exposure. That kid's, what, five, six years old, right? You generally, they say, count up the wrist bones, it'll roughly tell you the age. So I'm, I, see, I see like four or five of them. That's a perfect age for pica. And here's the kid's KUB that shows there are three windowsills in the GI tract. And so um, and when you see that positive lead in the GI tract, that's got to go because that's ongoing toxicity, so it's whole bowel irrigation. Lithium, still around, not used as much by psychiatry as it used to be, and it too can be sneaky. It still shows up on exams too. Um, they might have hyponatremia, and if they do have hyponatremia, it worsens the toxicity. Serum levels don't predict the CNS levels, um, and the serum levels are really only useful in the acute overdose in someone who does not take lithium regularly. Many times the levels are misleading. You'll see a level, <coughs> you know, a 2.1 or 2.2, which might, you might think oh, that's not too bad, but it's a chronic thing and they can be really bad. 
Clinical is tremor and seizures and altered mental status. They may have diarrhea. Oddly, there's some things about the diarrhea that might, you don't always see it, but I've seen it twice in my career. If they have a pinkish hint to the diarrhea, like it looks a little like undigested Pepto. Remember, Pepto comes out black. But the diarrhea looks like that Pepto pink. That's lithium, if you see that. Um, if they have seizures, use benzos or phenobarb. And the reason they say not to use dilantin is because dilantin decreases the excretion, so it worsens and prolongs the toxicity. These are tough patients, and they can get by you, too. They're sneaky, so you want to think of lithium. They'll ask the EKG questions, bradycardia, QT prolonged, and T-wave flattening. Or inversion. Look at this, diffuse nonvascular T-wave inversions with a prolonged QT. That's a lithium EKG. There's only a few EKGs you need to know. PAT with block, that's DIG. This one here, the bradycardia with the diffuse nonvascular T wave inversion, QT prolongation, that's lithium. And then the other one you need to know is a tricyclic overdose, which we'll get to in a moment, which is widened QRS and an, and an R wave in AVR. Clinical status more important than the level. I've said it a bunch of times. Don't be misled by the levels. Hydrate them with normal saline because the normal saline, the, the sodium, will compete with the lithium. Um, this is a perfect water-soluble, small volume of distribution drug. So if they're sick, they get dial dialysis. Particularly if they're, if they're in a coma or having seizures, you need dialysis for this. Get rid of it quickly. And they'll clear their lithium very, very quickly with dialysis in a couple hour run. Worst risk in renal failure. Worst risk, they might give you someone who's a psych patient recently started on a thiazide diuretic. They like that. The recent initiation of a diuretic, which then ends up in a rising lithium level with decreasing lithium excretion, is a common sort of format for that question. You might not need to know the little detail about the hydrochlorothiazide, but if you see that in there, it's a real hint they're going after lithium. Monoamine oxidase inhibitors with the, you know, the severe hyperthermia and agitation that can occur um, if they're given these other drugs, the hypertensive crisis in the setting of amphetamines, cheese, wine, fava beans, tyramine-related compounds that can cause that um, are the things you're looking for. MAO inhibitors are really not often used anymore, but they might mention someone who's using a lot of St. John's Ward. St. John's Ward is, uh, has got MEO inhibitor type compounds in it. Fava beans, you don't see those very often anymore. You know, it always comes up in the G6PD questions. Oh, they can't have fava beans. And I always wondered, you know, why do they have it? But when you go to the Mediterranean, they use fava beans and all kinds of stuff. I had this Lebanese, Coptic Lebanese guy when I was visiting Egypt and I was in Cairo and he spoke pretty good English. So I kept him as my cab driver for a while. And after a couple days, I said, show me Coptic Cairo. And he's like, well, Coptic Cairo is pretty poor and they have a horrible life and they're being person. I'm like, sure, just take me to one of the places where you guys hang. So I went to this place and they served me, and this was my first hint, a dish called Fool. <laughs> <coughs> it was fabulous. It was fava beans with mint and raw tomatoes and this sort of vinaigrette. Oh, yeah, the GI problems I had after that. Remember in Cairo, they fertilize their, their fields and water their fields with something euphemistically called night soil. That's when they drain their sewage out over the fields. So everything in those fields is basically, no matter what it is, cucumber, tomato, anything that comes out of the field is basically a container of E. coli. So the uncooked veggies in the fool in Cairo you know when, you know, there's these words in medicine you learn about. Like tenesmus is one of those words. <laughs> and you read about it, you're like, oh, tenesmus, yeah, that's that, but you know, until you have it, you have no idea. Like tenesmus is a completely inadequate name for what it really is, which I think it should be recalled histaminic anal crisis, because that's what it is, right? You need to know where a bathroom is at all motherfucking times, and it can't be more than like 10 feet away. That's what happened to me after the fool. I suddenly understood tenesmus. All right, metahemoglobinemia results from the oxygenation of normal iron um, and to the 2 plus to the 3 plus. It's unable to bind oxygen. What are the causes? 
if they have a home, somebody who smokes their own bacon or sausage, that's the nitrites and the nitrates. Benzocaine, you ever seen someone getting sprayed, the benzocaine in their throat turn blue? You're trying to do some procedure in their mouth. Ah, they're, they're like spitting the stuff. You're like, a little more, a little more. And then they turn blue. That's met hemoglobinemia. If you've never seen that, it happens. Um, you know, back off on the benzocaine. Um, and pyridium can do it as well. They present with vague symptoms um, and they can get cyanosis. Uh, and they'll get better when you put them on oxygen usually. Um, but not always, as this slide indicates. Cyanosis unresponsive when it's uh, more significant. They might have chocolate brown blood. They'll talk about that in lab. They, they might say you draw their blood and it looks brown. That's uh, met hemoglobinemia. <clears throat> and if you give them methylene blue, it will treat it and reverse it. Now, they always say this thing on the bottom, and I've always wondered, because I had the fava beans, which are contraindicated in the G6BE de de deficiency, and it was in the Mediterranean where there's a lot of people with that G6BD deficiency. So obviously those people learn you can't have the fava beans. But now, they always say this, methylene blue contraindicated in G6PD deficiency, but they never say what you do do if they have that. Like, I don't know what the answer is to that. Um, if anyone knows the answer, I'm interested in hearing it. All right, now we get to the mushrooms. Mushrooms are kind of fun stuff to talk about, right? The saying, there's, there are old mushroom uh, um, gatherers and there are bold mushroom gatherers, but there are no old, bold mushroom gatherers. And the reason for this is, is that if you boldly go about picking mushrooms and you don't know what you're doing, some of those mushrooms can look really pretty normal and edible and they aren't. Some mushrooms really loudly announce that you shouldn't eat them, but most, there are a whole bunch of them that look normal, like the false morel. Morels are delicious. I can remember picking morels as a kid. You could sell them for 30 bucks, uh, you know, a half bushel um, back then. I, now they're probably five times that. Um, but anyway, so you could get it wrong. Now, the thing with mushrooms is this, after you eat them, the sooner the symptoms, the better off you are. So you saute them up, you're thinking things are good, you eat the mushrooms, and 90 minutes later you're like, I got tenesmus, I got to go, that's good for you. If you eat them and think that was great and you're sipping your after dinner drink and then you go to bed and in the morning you wake up with diarrhea 12 hours later, that's bad. So delayed onset to symptoms means the mushroom you, you had is more serious. See that thing, it's called a death cap. I think you can buy that in Vaughn's right now. It looks just like the thing you buy in Vaughn's. So you kind of need to know what you're doing with mushrooms. Like that one, I could see how if you were out there on, you know, what is that show, Naked and Alone? Yeah, I'd eat that thing. You know, because it looks totally edible. And you can see that that would be a mistake. That's Amanita phylloides. Nausea, vomiting 12 hours later, then the toxin kills your hepatocytes, then you need a liver transplant. That's not good. Now, you're out there naked and alone. You're on the TV show. You see those. I don't think you have to be very smart not to eat that. Everything about that, you just look at it, you feel like you're in Alice in, Alice in Wonderland's thing. Like you already feel like you're hallucinating. I think that mushroom says loud and clear, don't eat this. Like, like you don't need to know anything about a rattlesnake. Right, you come up on a rattlesnake, all coiled up the head back, the tail going, come fuck with this. You don't need to know anything about a rattlesnake. You could be from another planet, you should step back. You don't need, and I feel the same way about this mushroom. There's nothing about that mushroom that says, go ahead, saute me up. So that's muscaria, uh, which gives you mental status change, hallucination, delirium, seizures, but not hepatic toxicity. So one amanita, the death cap, kills your liver, and this one uh, gives you delirium and hallucinations. Now let's go down to psilocybin. Those also look delicious. I'd be all for, you know, get the butter melting. I'm going for it. But those will cause hallucinations, euphoria, it's nausea, GI stuff, but early after you eat them. All right, we're moving through the alphabet. Neuroleptics and phenothiazines, dystonia reactions, right? The bent neck, the uh, torticollis, rigidity, oculogyric crisis. Now there's a name that sounds like what it is. I'm sure if you had that, you'd be like, oh yeah, that's oculogyric crisis, that's a good name. Then there's akesthesia, which is where they, you've all seen that, right? Somebody got some composite or something and they whip out their IV and you go into the room like, what, what, what's going on? And they, I gotta go. They always say the same thing, I gotta go. And they're like, they're like getting up. Imagine if you could find out what causes that exactly. <laughs> How rich you would be with the patent on that drug. And I would call the drug, I gotta go. <laughs> Imagine how often it'd be used in your emergency room. You'd be like, really? 
He wants to see, no, give him five milligrams, but I gotta go. <laughs> Actually, nurse, make it 10. <laughs> You'd be so rich. But anyway, that's akesthesia. So akesthesia and dystonia are different things. <clears throat> and then they can get the anticholinergic symptoms and things like that as well. So the rest of the thing there. And it's not good to be on these neuroleptics if you're in a hot environment. Diane was talking about heat exposure and some of those things, and these can make it worse as well. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome, Diane talked about this. When you cool these off, they don't really wake up. It's slow onset over days. They get lead pipe rigidity. They're planking. Um, they may have elevated CKs and renal failure and hypertension and all of that. And the treatment is fever control, benzos, and then look at that bottom. That probably should be in a yellow box down there. There aren't many places on an on a exam where you're calling out dantrolene and bromocryptine. So those are in the sort of antidote for neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Narcan, we've already talked about, half-life 30 to 60 minutes. You can precipitate withdrawal with it. We talked about some of the other reasons not to go high-dose Narcan. You can use almost any route with it, although in Pulp Fiction, when they did the intracardiac route, I felt like, you know, I, I, I was in L.A. when I saw that movie the first time, and people were, like, writing notes. I wanted to stand up. Public announcement, no. Don't go for the intracardiac, go into the tongue. If you gotta stick someone in, you know, do something like that. Oral hypoglycemics. Remember that the non-sulfonylureas, metformin and that stuff, they don't cause hypoglycemia. And if they're on an oral agent, a, a sulfonylurea like gliburide or glipizide, one of those, and they have hypoglycemia, the standard answer on the exam is they need to be admitted and followed and if they have recurrent hypoglycemia in the emergency room, you need to put them on D5 or D10. And if it happens again after that, then they get an octreotide drip. And that octreotide drip is a new thing, right, relatively new in the last five years or so. Uh, and so that's kind of an examinable thing, and it comes up that you might do that to prevent them from getting their recurrent hypoglycemia. Risk factors, extremes of age, alcohol, hepatorenal insufficiency, that all makes pretty good sense. Renal stuff in particular, you know, if they have renal insufficiency, it makes the oral hypoglycemics that much stronger because they stay around that much longer. So metformin and fenformin, which we don't see anymore. Remember the fenformin diets, but people still get it over the border. You can still get fenformin over the border in Mexico or pick the place where you want to cross and get it. Uh, causes lactic acidosis and it can cause severe acidosis with contrast. So that's kind of worth knowing about. <clears throat> Symptomatic patients with sulfonylurea or metformin should, like I say, be admitted. I, I think in the real world, there's some latitude on this. You might ob some of them. You might you know, make sure they're not having a lot of recurrent hypoglycemia and do it. But be clear, at ABEM General, they want you to admit these. Treatment, glucose, bolus, and drip, glucagon, octreotide, the bottom there, as I indicated, is where we're at with this, with the octreotide for refractory sulfonylurea overdose with recurrent hypoglycemia despite the other stuff, gets octreotide. Some poisonous plants, the stone fruit, get, they have cyanide in their cores. The anticholinergic plants, deadly nightshade, hembane, and ginseng weed. And the ditch plants are folly, uh, foxglove, oleander, and lily of the valley. Um, so those questions sometimes come up. Almost everyone has seen somebody who inadvertently got into one of these ditch toxic plants. The common story is the, you know, the Eagle Scouts are all out, gonna, they're looking to grill some hot dogs. They can't find anything but oleander, so they strip the bark off, put the hot dogs on it lengthwise, put it into the fire. And so it turns out the hot dog is an excellent transport and solution media for the um, uh, toxic uh, glycosides that are in there. And so then they eat them and they get, you know, they get bradycardic and they get their ditch stuff going on, their PAT with block, and that's a classic sort of plant story. So there's your stone fruit. That's where laetrile was made from, is pits of apricots and things like that. Gets you your cyanide. <clears throat> there's detura species with the trumpet flower or the dragon weed, it's called. It's all over LA, it's all over here too. In fall, it gets those pods, and when those pods break open, they have this white sort of milkweed like fur with these black seeds so if you see someone with like white fur and pot what looks like poppy seeds in their mouth with pupils the size of you know small uh, you know coffee dishes that's anticholinergic due to the jimson weed and that's called the autumnal high 
And the kids learn, where do they go to get the information? How, who's telling these kids how to do this shit? You go to the web, you go to, and, and the vaults of Arrowhead is a really cool site run by a couple of pharmacists and a couple other docs, but they, they've been trying to close the vaults of Arrowheads forever. It's got all kinds of really useful information, how to find out if your, if your ecstasy is bad and what about the high potency marijuanas and all of that stuff is all there um, if you want to look for it. And they'll give you recipes. So the autumnal high it only happens with the seed pods, but I've seen them in spring doing the flowers. You make a tea out of the flowers and they tell you how to sort of titrate it up. Last time I had four teenagers with the tea um, from the uh, dragon weed, this detura species. And three of them were not that bad, but one of them was full on delirious and we gave the physostigmine to and all the stuff. It was great fun. And there's foxglove and the oleander. Oleander comes in a different, you know, the, the pink, the white. I think there's a yellowish one too. It's the break between the highways on Route 5 for much of California. If you're wondering what that plant is between the northbound and southbound lanes, it's oleander. Um, it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's one of those, it's almost a pest pan. If you plant it, you can't get rid of the shit. You have, you have to try everything. Like, like I say, you can have, you know, Mack trucks driving by spewing toxic fumes all day long. It'll still grow just great. Tobacco, I remember the first time I tried chewing tobacco, that was a mistake. Um, I was like 16 and I got all the salivation and confusion and stuff. I didn't seize, fortunately. It was miserable. Um, but you'll see that pediatric ingestion of cigarettes can happen. Remember, the cigarettes can be tainted with other stuff, too. Uh, so you got to be alert to other things that are in cigarettes. Um, and you can do lavage and charcoal and benzos if they're having seizures or are real whacked out with it. It'll usually make them better. Rat poison, super warfarin, as I said, you know, the two-year-old who's begin, you know, beginning to cruise, doing their thing. You know, they're looking for this in the corners. They're going to eat it with a cat turd and a ball of hair. Um, it's delicious. It's fabulous. Um, and they'll be, the half-life of this stuff is super long. So <coughs> the PT will increase over eight to 24 hours and it can last as long as five days. How, I was always surprised at the poison center. A lot of these are managed as an outpatient. You know, you just gotta tell them no trauma, no gym, no sports, those kinds of things, but they let them go and follow them. Um, it blocks instances of two, seven, nine, and 10, the standard vitamin K dependent stuff. Treatment is lavage, activated charcoal. You can give them vitamin K. If they're bleeding, you can give them FFP or PCCC. All the usual things that you would do for that. But a lot are managed with just some vitamin K and sent out. All right, salicylates, another important overdose, really common. It's out there. It comes not just in the tablet form, but oil of wintergreen is salicylate. Um, and it's, you know, it's sneaky. It, it can confuse you and look like sepsis. I'll never forget. One day I had a, I'd seen a couple of these over the years and, and they have, they talk about their altered mental status. They're sort of sedated, but agitated and irritable. They have that little mix. And so it's, you can kind of recognize it. And I remember a resident coming to me and said they had this lady who was in her 70s, she was altered, she had a low grade fever um, and the UA was negative and the chest x-ray was negative. And it was the usual question to the attending staff, you know, do I really need to tap this lady? She doesn't have any meningismus or things. She's a little bit wacky, but I don't know what her baseline is. And I looked at her nursing note and it indicated she had chronic arthritis. And so I went and I held her by her shoulders and kind of got eye contact with her. I said, ma'am, ma'am, what are you hearing? And this is a direct quote. Fucking and that was the hint that maybe we should check a salicylate level because she was describing her tinnitus. Um, and so you want to look for that. And remember, they get an anion gap metabolic acidosis from the uncoupling of their metabolics. And then they overbreathe. They get a respiratory alkalosis. So they have the, both things together. And with these, these people die of these with levels of, when they're chronic aspirin overdoses, they die with re remarkably low levels, 40s and 50s. Many of them are not recognized. They're admitted to the hospital as an old lady with sepsis, right? Somebody finds a couple white cells and a few bacteria and they call it urosepsis, um, but it's not. It's a salicylate overdose. They're hypotensive or they call it pneumonia because they start having some cardiac, imp they, they, because of the cardiotoxicity, they can get some pulmonary infiltrate, some pulmonary edema. So they call it pneumonia. And so these are missed and not appreciated. Um, in children, you'll see hyperventilation and diaphoresis. Uh, anything that's a nursing home, anytime you smell oil of wintergreen, like someone's got a diaper full of poop and someone thought they should make that better by putting some oil of wintergreen nearby, that can have high cutaneous absorption and super high potency. 
So look for those. As I mentioned here, you can see the hypoglycemia. We talked about that right up front because their metabolism's just chugging along and giving them the fever. Um, they can get the non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, which you might call pneumonia and sepsis. Um, and remember, in the chronic overdoses, the nomogram does not apply, as I have said several times, like a broken record. The treatment here is to alkalinize the urine, which is a form of ion trapping, not forced alkaline diuresis, which I encourage you to recognize as a wrong choice. You got to get the pH of the urine up to seven and a half or eight, even better. And you're going to give amps of bicarb in the fluid plus potassium and magnesium. So there's some positives to go with it. All right, serotonin syndrome. A lot of times the tox literature and sort of the books on this will kind of tell you that neuroleptic malignant syndrome and serotonin syndrome, you could really easily tell them apart. It's just not true. There's a lot of overlap between them. Yes, the neuroleptic malignant syndrome is slower onset and it has, you know, the lead pipe rigidity, but the serotonin syndrome often gives you lower extremity stiffness. Here's a list of some of the SSRIs. When they change their dose or increase their levels, uh, they can get all of these uh, changes of serotonin syndrome. It's rapid onset, altered mental status, dysautonomia, myoclonus, lower extremities, greater than upper. It's not true lead pipe, the whole body, as you see in NMS. It's more the lower extremities get stiff. And it's not cogwheeling stiffness. It's just stiff. Um, distinguished from NMS, and there you have the, in the red the bottom. And on an exam, they'll probably make it pretty straightforward which they want you to choose by the onset and some of the other findings that, I've, that are listed here in red. But in real life, it's not so straightforward. In real life, these can be confusing. Now we go to the TCAs. And again, many in the room are old enough to remember the days when you could have you know, a shift completely ruined by one or two TCAs that would keep you pinned at the bedside for hours while they you know, either seized or had dysrhythmias and you were doing everything you could to keep them alive. Um, remember that tricyclics have a bunch of different components to it. They have an anticholinergic effect, um, uh, which will give you the flush skin, dry mouth. They have some CNS effects and they can get confusion, ataxia, and seizures. The cardiovascular effects um, are there. And what usually happened in a bad TCA overdose was you'd sort of suspect what was going on. They might have had some dilated pupils, the anticholinergic effects. You kind of were figuring it out. And then they seized. And when they seized, the seizure caused acidosis, and the acidosis caused them to unbind drug. And so when they unbound drug during the acidosis, that precipitated cardiac toxicity, and they went into VTAC. And so then you'd have to fight their way out of the VTAC and try to prevent the seizures, and you could be doing this. And some of these patients can take 8, 10, 12 amps of bicarb during their management, and they can be really rough to manage. <clears throat> and they get widened QRS and VTAC, and here's the EKG, or it's coming, the EKG that you need to know. Treatment is lavage and charcoal, but you often have to intubate them. Anytime, the answer for the antidote part of this is anytime a TCA does anything you don't like, the QRS widens, they have a dysrhythmia, they um, have a seat, you give an amp a bicarb or two. Anything you don't like, the reflex is bicarb. And remember, you're giving the bicarb not so much for the HCO3 minus, you're giving it just as much for the high doses of sodium to overcome the channel block that exists with it. If they get torsade, you can still use magnesium. And for delirium and seizures, it's benzos. But your first answer on any TCA is the bicarb. And here's the classic EKG, a little bit of tachycardia, a little bit of widened QRS. But the key thing is, look how big that R wave is in R. AVR has a monster wide R wave. And the R and R is the classic finding of cardiotoxicity in a TCA. And once you say it that way, then you don't have to read. There was a very famous article by uh, Neiman out of Harbor, UCLA, who described the early findings of tricyclic toxicity. And here's what he said. He said, thinking that the average air doc would understand him, he said, what you're looking for is counterclockwise rotation of the terminal 40 milliseconds of the QRS in the frontal plane. To which most the air docs said, what him say? What? I don't understand. What that all translates into is an R wave and AVR. AVR is in the frontal plane. 
that R wave is the terminal 40 milliseconds, and its expression and wideness of it is all about counterclockwise rotation of the axis. There you have it. So that's like the third important EKG. If you knew those three EKGs, you'd be way ahead. And there's the antidote, the bicarb. Now we got some tox smells. This is just a list because they sometimes do the smells. You know, how many of you are non-DKA smellers? There's always a bunch, yeah. I can walk into the critical area at Stony Brook and know there's like how many there are. I can, there's three DKAs. I think there's two over that way. And there's a, yeah, there's one down here. So I, I'm, I'm good at that, but the other things, not so good. Rotten egg smell, for example, you might smell it early on, but once it's in the department for a while, you become nose blind. You know those ads? You're nose blind. You actually downregulate your ability to smell that rotten egg very quickly. And there's some other ones there. Winter green, we've touched on. Um, pears, chloral hydride. I, I can't even really picture what pears smell like, even as I stand here. Fresh cut grass, phosgene. All right. So when might you see something in the belly on an x-ray? This is a good one. And there's a couple difference of these mnemonics. I always use the one that's chipes, but it gets you to the same thing. This one's coins, and it tells you how to look for things. The key one on this, on a case, right, they're going to give you a white count and a kid who's not looking good with GI symptoms, and it's going to be iron. And so they get whole bowel irrigation until that iron is gone. Um, what do I like on here? You know, charcoal not useful, that's a pretty good list. Um, whole bowel irrigation, pretty good list. Sustained release glove, drugs, and the iron and the lead I would add to that list and the body packers. We're into a few little things. Non-dialyzable drugs, cyanide, it doesn't come off. TCAs, protein bound. Iron, you can't get it out of there. Benzos, distributed into the fat. Phenothiazines, hallucinogens, they're, they're out of the compartment you're dialyzing. So they're non-dialyzable. 